Well, good morning. My name is Todd Malone, I'm the lead pastor here, and it is great to have you with us this morning. I'm going to continue to sit down for just another week or two while my ankle continues to heal, uh, but it's getting close, so that's exciting. I love the fact that we get to come together and do this. Um, here is my goal every Sunday morning. My goal every Sunday morning is that you would encounter the Lord, examine what his word says about what it means to live life with him. And because we do that, because we've encountered the Lord and examined his word, we leave here a little different. So, uh, I need to confess that one of the challenges of working with me uh, is me. Especially the fact that you never, ever know what I'm going to say when I get up here. I went to lunch with Gary Lewis this week. Gary heads our administrative staff. And after lunch, he came straight back to the church. But I needed to stop by Albertsons, so I'd taken my own car and I stopped by Albertsons. And what that meant was that Gary got back to the office before me and I wasn't immediately following. That created speculation amongst the staff. It created a level of, I don't know if anxiety is the right word, but they were having fun with it. So when I walked in the front door, Catherine Rosner, who's on the staff, says out loud, he's not dead. <laughs> Kathy Silvertooth, also on staff, immediately bore her soul, did not hesitate, with full conviction said, shoot. <laughs> she saw that I was a little bit hurt, a little bit stunned, so she thought she better explain herself. She said, it was more fun when we thought you were dead. And you think your office environment's rough. <laughs> We're in week two of the Micah series. And last week, we saw that Micah is speaking to an audience that thought it was a lot more fun to think that God was dead. Micah's message in chapter one was that guess what? God is alive and he's well and he is coming to set things right. So a quick review of the background that we mentioned last week. God's people, Israel, they had been given an assignment, and their assignment was to reflect the character of God to the nations around them so the nations would know who their God is and come to have a relationship with them. But they weren't living that out. And instead, they end up, by the time we get to Micah, they are actually divided into two separate kingdoms. One of them still has the name Israel. The other one has the name Judah. Now, the thing is, both of these kingdoms were actually very prosperous. They were doing extremely well, but they were also very, very corrupt. In chapter 1, Micah declares that God is about to show up with unimaginable authority and power, and he is going to remove the idolatry that's operating underneath their corruption. We noted last week that Micah's name actually means who is like God. And the answer that Micah wants his people and us to come to again and again is that there is no one like God. No one or nothing in all creation is like God. Last week we said that idolatry was more than them worshiping their false gods at pagan altars. They probably were doing that. But the real problem was that they had lost their awe of God and they replaced it with awe of themselves. And now as we come to chapter 2, we're going to see Micah get more specific 
as exactly how they were doing this, what this looked like in practice. And the very first issue he's going to deal with is a pastor's least favorite issue, money. And he's going to look at what is the role of money in the lives of these people. Because individuals and the culture at large were being poisoned by greed. And in, in Micah 2, 1 through 11, Micah takes us through the passion that is associated with their greed. He's going to look at the cost of their greed, even on the greedy, as well as diving into the idolatry that's underneath their greed. Verses 1 and 2 actually introduce us to the passion that's tied to their greed. And let's get into this by... Um, Describing someone to you from literature and see if you know who this is. Oh, but he was a tight-fisted hand at the grindstone. A squeezing, wrenching, grasping, scraping, clutching, covetous old sinner. Hard and sharp as flint from which no steel had ever struck out generous fire. Secret and self-contained and solitary as an oyster. He carried his own low temperature always about with him. He iced his office in the dog days and didn't thaw it one degree at Christmas. Who is that? <laughs> Ebenezer Scrooge, and my favorite version of Ebenezer Scrooge or of the Christmas Carol is the Muppets. Um, <laughs> love the Muppets. But that's actually Charles Dickens, if you go to the book, that's how he describes Scrooge. And I love that description because it's totally over the top. And you kind of smile at it. And then you think about, what if that person actually existed? What would that be like? Well, verses 1 and 2 are telling us that Scrooge was warm and fuzzy compared to these people. Verses 1 and 2 describe them as literally lying awake at night. And they are thinking and planning and working out how to make themselves rich at the expense of other people. And then they get up in the morning and they actually carry out their plans because they had the power to do it. And they have the resources to make it happen. They see something they want. They take it, and they do not care who gets hurt. There are a couple of key words in these verses that really hammer home how bad these people were. When verse 1 says they devise wickedness, it's saying that they literally think about how to actively carry out evil with at least part of their goal being to hurt others. The word oppress in verse 2 means that they would use violence or deception or legal power to take people's houses and land. They want what others have, and they want to get it by underhanded means. Now, that sounds bad, but if you know more of the background, you see how bad this really is. If you go back to Leviticus 25, this is when the people of Israel are first coming into the land. And they have had to deal with other nations that were in that land, and they took care of those nations, and now they are settling in. And how does this nation of Israel get the land divided amongst the people? What they did is they, they would cast lots for it. And that's what Joshua did. The people would come to him and they had a list of all the land and it doesn't tell us how, but somehow they cast lots. And doing that, they would divide the land amongst the people. And it says in Leviticus 25, as he's describing that, it says a family's land was to be viewed as an eternal inheritance for that family, giving to them by God. So once it was determined which plot of land belonged to the family, the idea was for that family, that is God's gift to them forever. And it is through that land that that family will be provided for. It is through that land that generation after generation will be tied to the community. So what these people in Micah are doing is they are taking away something that God has said it's not theirs to take, regardless of the circumstances. This is a direct assault 
on the value system God put in place. They cared more about the land than the people that land was supposed to support. Greed consumed these individuals and it was destroying their society. They were passionate about their sin. I mean, these are people who laid awake at night and thought about how to do it. And then when they got up the next morning, they carried it out. Their sin was an outworking of their hearts. And there is a word for that. And the word for that is coveting. You see, this is the essence of coveting. The essence of coveting is saying to ourselves, I need something that I do not now have in order to be happy. I need something that I don't now have in order to be happy. And they were saying, I need a little more money to be happy. So I'm going to take this person's home or I'm going to take that person's land and then I'll be happy. Or at least a little closer. This is a really good place for us to start examining ourselves. What do you lack that you think you need to be happy? That's a hard question. What do you lack that you think that you need in order to be happy? What do you covet? Let me ask you the exact same question, but with a different spin on it. What role does money play in your life? Here's what I mean. I grew up not well off. Let's put it that way. Our family wasn't desperate, but we had very clear financial limitations, and we ran into those limits pretty quickly. I have a really clear memory of being in a Mervyn's department store shortly after I graduated from college. And I remember standing in that store and looking at a jacket and thinking to myself, at some point in my life, I want to be able to buy a $50 jacket without stressing about it because I had never experienced that before. Now, here's the question. What did I think I lacked in that moment? I'll give you a hint. It wasn't a jacket. What I thought I lacked was significance. I looked at myself, and because I didn't have money, I felt small. I felt like I didn't matter. I felt insignificant. And I was looking for the ability to buy something that I wanted as the way to make me feel significant. That's coveting. Maybe significance isn't the issue for you. Maybe it's a lack of security. Maybe you live in fear that if one more thing goes wrong with your car, you're going to end up in disaster. Maybe it's not immediate security. Maybe you look at yourself and your finances and say, I don't know that I will ever be able to retire. Or maybe it's a lack of status. And you want to be able to show your accomplishments to the world through the house that you own or the car that you drive. It's coveting. We covet when we think that what we lack is what will give us happiness. And when we covet, we are not far from the mindset of the people in verses 1 and 2. Micah's audience had a passion. It was for their sin of greed. They planned ways. They thought about ways to get what they coveted. And then they carried out those plans, not caring who it hurt. Verses 3 to 5 then change the subject a little bit. And they show us what that greed costs. And the price that they pay for their greed is that they are going to lose what they love. And here's what's fascinating. The way the Lord's going to respond to their greed in Micah's day was to take away from them the very things that they love the most. 
That's the actual emotional impact. That's the emotional power that he's trying to communicate through verse 3. The Lord's opening statement in verse 3 to the people is that he is going to do to them what they have done to others. He begins by saying, behold, against this family. That should echo back to what the greedy people did. Remember? They stole homes and land from families. It says that the Lord is devising something in verse 3. Here's what's interesting. That's the exact same Hebrew word that was used in verse 1 to describe the people. In other words, this is no more spontaneous for the Lord than it was for them. The Lord is intentional and purposeful in what he is doing. What he is devising is then called a disaster. Now, here's what's really fascinating. It is the exact same Hebrew word used in verse 1 when it talked about their wickedness. So is this saying that the Lord is wicked? No. What it's saying is that the Lord is going to bring that same complete calamity on them that they brought on other people. This is going to be devastating to them. They are going to feel what they have done to others. Then verses five, 4 and 5 detail the calamity. Verse 4 is saying that the nation's enemies will rise up against them. They're going to taunt them. Then Israel is going to take up that lament as well. They will moan because they are ruined. Enemies have come in and taken all their land and homes from them. Now, verse 5 sounds very strange unless you remember what I said about how the, line, how the uh, land had originally been divided through Joshua casting lots and dividing among the families. So what verse, is five, what verse 5 is saying is that the land is going to be taken away. It's going to be run and controlled by foreigners just like it was when you first came into that land hundreds of years before. But this time, this time, there will be no Joshua to give back the land and divide it to the people. There's one more thing that we need to notice, and it may be the most important thing, and that's in the middle of verse 3. God's not just going after their circumstances. He's not just going after their wealth. God is going after their hearts. In the middle of verse 3, Micah says that the result of judgment is that you shall not walk haughtily. That's saying these people were arrogant. And God's going to deal with that. And you see, here's the thing. Arrogance, pride, is always, it was then, it is today, always a declaration that we can be and are independent of God. And if you've lived more than about 10 minutes, you know how that works. At least I know how it works in my life. I say that I trust the Lord, but then what I think is that I, if I have enough of a financial cushion, then I will be okay. If I have enough of a financial cushion, then I won't have to worry. Then I won't have to trust God. Because I know that I can handle whatever life throws at me. We had communion a couple of Sundays ago, and during that time, Steve asked us to evaluate kind of where we were with the Lord, what we were struggling with. And during that time, I was praying and thinking about what am I struggling with? And what the Holy Spirit kept bringing up to me was how much I live as if I don't need God. Right? If the bills are paid, food's on the table, if everyone's comfortable, it's easy to lose sight of how dependent I really am on God. Guess what? That's pride. You don't have to be rich to lose sight of who you really depend on. It's one of the subtlest and most devastating costs that Micah's audience had to pay. They became arrogant. They were proud. They believed that their well-being 
actually depended on their bank account and not the Lord. And they tried to live without him. Verses 3 through 5 is God reestablishing reality for them. They are, in fact, dependent on him, and they are going to experience it. Micah's audience didn't care who they hurt to get what they wanted, but ultimately who they hurt was themselves. And God was going to remove what they loved most and expose that they were trying to live independently of him. Then verses 6 through 11 uncover why God has to expose this pride and independence. And that's because at its depth, greed is really idolatry. Verses 6 through 11 are really hard to understand. They're really hard to follow because what's actually going on is it's almost like you're watching a play and you've got these subtle, subtle, subtle shifts between speakers going on. And it's not always clear who's speaking when. But let me see if I can break this down for you. Verses 6 through the first part of verse 7 it's the people who are speaking, the greedy who's speaking. And what they are saying is, Micah, don't preach these things. Our God's a loving and patient God. He likes us. Our God's a nice God. He won't do these things to us. And then the speaker shifts. And in the last part of verse 7, it's now Micah speaking, very possibly quoting God and saying, you know what, I preach these things and I'm going to preach these things because they are good for those who are upright, those who are trying to reflect the character of God, doing the things that they were called to do. And then in verses 8 and 9, Micah starts evaluating. So, are you people upright? Is this really good news for you? And here's what he observes. In verse 8, they actually act like God's enemies. How do they act like God's enemies? They do it by stealing clothes from travelers who are coming through their land in complete peace. They don't mean any harm. They're not trying to create. They're just people coming through. And what do they do? They steal the very clothes off their back. And their stealing doesn't stop there. According to verse 9, they find the houses of women. It's probably referring to widows. And the inheritance that's supposed to be for their children. And they take those. Verses 10 and 11 is saying that they are going to be physically removed from the land because of their evil. But guess what? That's just an outward expression of what's going on inside. Because in verse 11, it's saying they have already removed their hearts from God. They don't want to hear his word. What they would rather hear about is the pleasures of their culture. The sermons they want to hear were sermons in honor of the gods of their culture. Wealth, power, authority, influence. People kind of treated God like he is an annoying little sibling. Who here has an annoying little sibling? Who here is an annoying little sibling? Um, you know when that no annoying little sibling will say, I told you so? And then will tell you in great detail how they told you so? And all you want that, do, all you want that little sibling to do is to, um, I'll use parent appropriate words here, be quiet or change the subject. When Micah preaches against their greed, the people treat him like he's that annoying little sibling. And they tell him to stop talking or change the subject. Why do they do this? Because it's more important to them that Micah tells them that they are right than that he tells them what is true. It's more important to them that Micah tells them how to live successfully in a culture of greed than to tell them about the God who can overcome their greed. They didn't want the words of God. They wanted the words of their culture that would make them feel good about themselves. See, they created a false God. 
They pictured God as loving and gracious, and that is true. Our God is loving and gracious, but they also pictured him as someone who doesn't care about what we do, who doesn't care about how we treat people. That's the God they wanted Micah to preach. And they wanted sermons on wine and strong drink. That's not sermons saying wine and strong drink are bad. What they're asking for are sermons that say how to live well by the culture's standards. And Micah's answer is no way. He is, he is going to tell the truth. And if they are upright, that's going to be good for them. And if they are not, it's going to be a warning. And they want Micah to give him a false god who looks just like their culture. But Micah says that's not going to happen. I'm going to give you the true God who you need. When I first started here as lead pastor, I had someone give me some advice, someone who's not in this church. Um, They gave me this advice. They said, if you want to grow a large church, you need to preach the Bible less. You need to do self-help sermons more. And you know what? That person was right. One of the fastest ways I know of to grow a church is to preach the Bible less and give you lots of sermons on how you can succeed by the culture's standards. How you can get the wealth you want, the car you want, the job you want, the career you want. If I actually had that knowledge. And you know what? There are a lot of churches that do just that. But if our church ever does that, guess what we're doing? We are reinforcing idols. So here's another question for you. When you walk through the door on Sunday morning, which God are you looking for? Do you long to hear God's word? Do you long to know him better and know how to live a life with God? Are you looking for something different? See, our culture says that there's nothing wrong with you as long as you're rich, attractive, influential, and popular. Have you ever noticed how much our Christian culture takes that exact same message and says, And now we're going to show you how to be all those things. Ever walked into a Christian bookstore and seen all of the self-help books? Gone to Christian conferences, listened to Christian podcasts, even listened to sermons. But that's what the message was. They take what the culture holds as most valuable and they use God's name to get it and justify it. They are preachers of wine and strong drink. And here's the problem. When the audience of those preachers don't get what they want, when they don't get the cultural success, they think that God didn't deliver on his promise. It never occurred to them that God actually never made that promise. Because God is not in the business of giving people their idolatry. You may not know this about Sunday morning, but one of the most important things that happens on Sunday morning is this service is designed to, in very subtle ways, undo what our culture is constantly trying to get us to think and value and feel. It is trying to undo the idolatry of our culture. And this area that Micah deals with in chapter 2 is one of the biggest areas. The idolatry of greed is one of our culture's biggest idols. Here's the reality. And you're going to wish that I would have said this before we took the offering. God could instantly supply every financial need for every church and every ministry in the world. He does not need you to do it. He doesn't. So why is it that God instructed his people 
from the earliest times of the Old Testament all the way through the New Testament to financially support the priests, to financially support the temple, and then ultimately to financially support pastors and churches. What's he doing there? Why doesn't he just give us the money? It's because of what it does to the giver. In the act of giving, you are enacting a counter-cultural re revolt. You are saying, although the culture says, my well-being depends on my wealth, you are declaring, I know that my well-being depends on the Lord. It's interesting, Ann and I are set up for automatic giving. It just comes out of our bank account every week. And it's really convenient. You can do that. I think you can find information in the bulletin. That's great. But I'm going to tell you it creates a problem. Here's the problem. I miss out on the transforming power of physically putting money in the basket on Sunday. Actually participating in the offering is a way, is a discipline that the Holy Spirit uses to reshape my values, to look less like my culture, and to look more like the Lord. So, I don't want to lose the convenience. So here's what I'm starting to do. Every Sunday, as the basket goes by, when I touch that basket, it's a reminder. It's a trigger. I'm, I'm reminded to say to the Lord, thank you for being the one who truly cares for me and truly meets my needs. See, when we take the offering on Sunday mornings, don't think of it as a check mark, fulfilling your responsibilities in order to keep God happy. God does not need your money. Don't think of it just as supporting the church. That's important. But that's not the major reason to give. Think of it as participating in the work that the Holy Spirit is doing in your life to reshape your thinking and your values. It's part of what happens on Sundays that keep you less in awe of yourself and more in awe of God. I suspect everyone in this room, if you are honest, will say to yourself, so what do I do? Because when I look at myself, I am a lot like my culture. I think like my culture, I value what my culture values. And if I'm really honest, if I'm really honest, I am terrified to have to truly depend on the Lord. So what do we do? I wanna take us back to the very foundation, to the very message of the gospel. Here's the Bible summarized in just a few sentences. We were created to have intimate fellowship with God where he provided for all of our needs and we would know him personally. And that's the world as it actually existed at the very beginning. That's the Garden of Eden. But coveting, pride, crept in and Adam and Eve said I want to be just like God which is another way of saying I really want to be independent of God and that broke the relationship between God and humanity and the effects of that are felt in all of creation why do people get sick why does my ankle go bad and I have to have the Achilles replaced it's part of the effects of sin, of that brokenness that entered the world. Why do I have broken relationships with people? Why do I feel distant from God? It all goes back to that. But that's not the end of the story. Because the next part of the story is that God said, you can't fix this on your own because it's hardwired into you. So I'm going to solve the problem for you. And he sent 
his very son, who is perfectly God, to become perfectly man and to live the perfect life that we were meant to live, but didn't. And then he died on the cross to pay the penalty and restore the relationship between God and man. And when we put our faith in him instead of ourselves, here's what happens. Jesus' righteousness from his perfect life gets applied to us, and when God looks at us, he says, that's what I see. And all of the sin, all of that brokenness in our lives gets applied to Jesus. And when God looks at us, he says, not guilty. And then the story goes on. Because three days later, Jesus was raised from the dead. And it says the same, Bible says the same power that raised Jesus from the dead lives in you if you're a Christian to give you a new life. And ultimately, that renewal of life goes beyond us. And the Lord is going to restore the whole world. We end up back in kind of a version of the Garden of Eden. That's what heaven actually is. Why do I say all that? That's, that's your whole Bible in a few sentences. Why do I say that? Because if you're someone who didn't grow up in church, and you're sitting here thinking, I have no idea what to make of all of this. I just know that I struggle. In fact, I never knew it was a struggle to have the world's values, the culture's values. And I don't know how to get out of it. The answer is, put your faith in Jesus. That's what it'll do. If you're a Christian, and you're saying to yourself, I've known this my whole life, but I still think that my well-being comes down to what's in my bank account. You need to remember the gospel. You need to remember that story. Because if the God who will do that for you who loves you that much, who cares for you that much, is in your life, there is nothing for your good that he will not withhold from you. God's people in Micah's time had become more in awe of themselves than of God. One way this showed up was their view of money. They were passionately greedy. They planned ways to get what they coveted. Then they carried out their plans, not caring who it hurt. But ultimately, it hurt them. God was going to remove from them what they loved most to remind them that they were always and would always be dependent on him. And this means returning to worship the true God, not the false gods that their culture created. And that takes us to the point of the passage and the point of the message. God will remove the poison of greed that destroys lives. Last week I introduced a question that's really important for us to come back to again and again throughout the series of Micah. And the question is this, what is the good life? In Micah's day and in ours, many people answer that question by saying the good life is having enough resources so I don't have to rely on anyone or anything including God, to get me through whatever life throws at me. But what's the good life really? It's a life that's lived in relationship with God that more and more reflects his character. And that's the good life because it allows you to be content with little or with much. It allows you to use the resources you've been given for God's purposes. And really, that's what these responses to the message are all about. And I've suggested four of them on this handout that you have when you came in. It's actually a place at the bottom for you to mark off how you want to respond to the message. And maybe it's one of these four. Maybe it's something different. I'd encourage you to take a second and actually mark that off. And if you've been here for a while, you hear me say this, hopefully every Sunday. There are two boxes in the foyer as you leave, on the right and the left of the foyer. And they are for you to stick these little cards in. And we as a staff will take those. And when the staff is not hoping that I'm dead, we will be praying for you. 
that um, the Lord will help you as you seek to apply these. Four responses. Ask God to show you how money has been a hindrance in your walk with the Lord. And that's not just to people who have a lot of money. It could be people like myself when I was out of college who couldn't afford to buy an inexpensive jacket, but that so consumed me that that's what I thought my significance was about. Choose one way to use money to worship God and serve others this month. Then I want to continue to encourage you to go through the discussion questions with someone this week. Don't try to do this on your own. The Christian life is never meant to be lived on your own. And then make a list of what Micah 2, 1 through 11 says about God. That's our whole emphasis this year. Who is God? What is he like? So take some time and look at that in the passage. I'm going to invite the prayer team to come forward, and then I'm going to close this in prayer. Why don't we stand together, prayer team? The prayer team is here to pray with you. No matter what you are facing, what you're struggling with, but boy, mostly if you don't know what it's like to have a restored relationship with God, please let one of us talk to you about that. Would you pray with me? Father, we are a people that have been so influenced by culture that we don't even realize how much we have adopted the idolatry that is around us. And Lord, forgive us that so often we think what we need to get through life has more to do with our bank account than it has to do with a relationship with you. And Lord, thank you that you forgive us for just that. Thank you that time and time again, no matter what we struggle with, no matter how our brokenness comes out, you welcome us home and you forgive us. And that's exactly why we can trust you with no matter what we're facing, because of how much you've loved us and you've proved it. Lord, help us to live in light of that truth today and this week. Pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Your well-being is in God's hands. It always has been. It always will be. The second you step outside of this room, you are going to encounter a culture that says, that's not true. God is not enough. Micah 2 gives you the message that God is enough and he will take care of you this week. You're dismissed.